Richard Fuller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady of the Member for Brighton Pavilion. And in her contribution, she certainly put out the most certain bet that she has been on more protests than most other people in this House, and she is honourable for doing so. Uh, she said, I think, that the contributions on this side had promoted divisiveness. I, I don't agree with her on that. I think people in this House have been trying to make their point of view. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, perhaps uh, standing alone, I shall be a sole voice in expressing some uh, reservations myself about the intent of some of the measures in this bill. Uh, I was very grateful to hear some of the contributions by uh, the Home Secretary, particularly her willingness to look at focusing on this bill, and uh, that would be something I would like to take up with the Policing Minister himself, who on previous bills has been able to uh, explain to me some of the more detailed provisions. Listening to this debate, at some points it's not been clear if members have been fo focusing on the issue that this bill is about protest, or this is about climate change, or this is about criminal damage. And I think where this bill is at its best is when it focuses in on those who would use protest as a cover for yeah. undertaking damage or creating unreasonable disruption. And that when it strays away from that, it starts to lose its way into an area where all democratic governments need to be careful, which is how does a government of the day pass legislation to have an effect on protest. So my first concern of principle, Madam Deputy Speaker, is around uh, imprecision, and I'll mention a couple of clauses on that. I had written down that I had some concerns about why, having just taken a bill through Parliament, a very large bill, we had this bill sort of represented uh, today. I do think the opposition, the right honourable lady, the leader of the opposition, uh, who spoke for the opposition, did have a point about why has this come back so soon, and whether we have uh, had time to see what the impact of the uh, measures have been. Again, uh, when the bill is tight to its intent, I can see the rationale. When it goes broader than that, I have some significant uh, questions. Now, one of the reasons that I am a Conservative is that I believe in uh, freedom of speech, the, pe the right of people to express themselves freely. Indeed, we as a government are emphasising that in a number of other aspects of legislation that we're taking through. We have highlighted the importance of it today in questions uh, to the Education Secretary about the importance of free speech in school and not having ideological perspectives. We're talking about it in universities as well. And as I thought with the police and crime bill, uh, the government is at risk of being in conflict with those freedom of speech uh, priorities as we propose a bill that might focus on some of the re restrictions on protest. And another point, which again comes up in this bill, as in the previous bill, is the risks that it puts on police officers being seen as political because of the decisions they made given the very broad range of framework that's uh, there and the fact that it's very hard to explain to someone who is being noisy or disruptive why it is they that are being uh, selected and not others. And it would be helpful in my conversations with this, I don't expect to address it today, to learn a bit more uh, about that. And my final concern of principle, Madam Deputy Speaker, is something that I think all honourable members here will, will recognise. Because surely it is true that our politics have become far more divisive over the last decade. And whatever the reasons may be, maybe it's just a matter of uh, political decisions, maybe it's a matter of social media, what's important when people feel very divided on politics is that you keep open to people as many of the avenues for them to express dissent, to express an opinion, to say where something is wrong as we possibly can. And that's important, I think, context for the Minister and the Government to think as they think about the application of this Bill. But let me turn to some points and the provisions. When I talked about the Bill being imprecise and about where it strayed from areas where it was strong in terms of uh, focusing on uh, using protests as a cover criminal damage, unfortunately clauses 1 and 2 start out that level of imprecision. I do think they are far too openly are worded. Everyone here seems to know what, um, uh, is it attaching on? I can't remember exactly what the phrase Locking is. On. Lo thank you. Locking on is. I have no clue, Madam Deputy Speaker, what locking on is. 
I don't know. And some people have made, some colleagues have made the point about what, it, what, what does one have to attach oneself? When one, I have no idea. And there's nothing in this bill to explain to me what locking on uh, may be. And I, I think it would be uh, helpful for the government to get some more provision. And it's more disappointing because when you, when you then go to clauses three, four, and five, the government is extremely precise about some of the measures that it wishes to see uh, through in three, four, and, and five. So precision is clearly not unavailable to the government, but it is a matter of choice where they have uh, played it. A number of honourable members have spoken to uh, Clause uh, 7, if I have it right, Madam Deputy Speaker, which introduces stop and search. And some people have rightly made the point about the disproportionality of, of stop and search. This is something that has been uh, an important issue for me in my time in, in, in Parliament. And my honourable friend, the right honourable member for the uh, South Honourable Deepings, who is no longer in his place, raised the point about, ah, yes, but what about the number of knives? What about uh, the, the number of offences that have been caught? Well, first of all, that doesn't answer the question of disproportionality, which is the fundamental reason why many of us have concerns about the use of stop and search. And second of all, that issue is completely inappropriate when you apply stop and search to people going on a protest because that isn't about other aspects of serious crime or serious drug dealing that we're talking about. This is about people expressing their points of view. And so I would say to the government very carefully, please, 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 if you're going to look at the extension of stop and search, uh, I would think very carefully before putting that uh, in this uh, legislation. And clause 7.7, 7, very briefly I will. It isn't just about the extension of stop and search, it's about many of the extensions in this bill. I, I, I was struck that if the noble Lord Hain, then Peter Hain, could be convicted of criminal conspiracy for leading direct action events in the 1970s, which he was in the anti-apartheid movement, why do we need this panoply of illiberal measures now when the law 40, 50 years ago was more than capable of dealing with many of the same issues? Well, his broader panoply of point of view. My, my point is very specific about stop and search. I hate the fact that a black man, perhaps with his son, walking in the streets of London or in my constituency in Bedfordshire, is 14 times more likely to be stopped, and very often for no good reason, and then have to explain that to his son or daughter about why that has happened. And until we as a population start to get this balance about whether it's useful or not, and focus on what it means to the next generation, I feel that we'll be letting down our young people. And, and, and Madam Deputy, Clause 7, subparagraph 7, is chilling. A constable may, in the exercise of the powers conferred by subsection 6, stop any person and make any search the constable thinks fit, whether or not the constable has any grounds for suspecting that person is carrying a prohibited object. On the way to a demonstration, Madam Deputy Speaker, we can do better uh, than that. And what is serious disruption? As many honourable members have mentioned, it is a linchpin in this bill for many other aspects of what may happen as a result. But it is not defined in this bill. And I'd like to know from the Minister whether it is intention, his intention to come forward with some more precise language about what constitutes a serious disruption uh, to enable us not to put that undue pressure on police officers to work it out for themselves in the heat of the moment as people are going on demonstrations. And I can't remember the Honourable Lady opposite who said, I think it might have been um, the Honourable, I can't remember who, who it was, who said, by the very dint that it is a large demonstration, it is very likely to cause serious disruption. If you have a protest of hundreds of thousands of people going through a city, that is likely to cause serious disruption. So if we're not going to define it, I do think, Minister, we're going to be in some risk of having some of these powers misapplied in the, the future. Uh, very lastly, yes, thank you. Um, surely it, such a large protest, such as we've seen about the Iraq war or about the hunting ban, would have all, already at earlier stages engaged with police in order to facilitate a proper, lawful, peaceful protest. What the government's trying to target here is those small, sporadic numbers of people going out and causing deliberate harm to specific areas of key infrastructure. Does he understand the difference between those two elements? Uh, I, I do, and I thank, I thank my honourable friend for that point. And, and I think that was re where I said this bill is at its best, is when it focuses in on those. I'm just saying to the Minister, we should have more precise definition. 
uh, in the Bill. And my final point, if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, is on uh, Clause 14.4, which uh, lists out the uh, prohibitions that may be imposed on someone subject to a serious disruption prevention order. I want to tell the Minister what this reminds me of. Early in my time as Member of Parliament for Bedford, I had a constituent who was under a control order. Now, the control orders were brought in for people who our intelligence services said were terrorists or were at high risk of causing a major terrorist incident. When I look down some of the provisions in Clause 14.4, they remind me very much of the provisions that that constituent was under as a matter of control order. And I ask the Minister in closing, please look about whether that level of intervention on the activities of an individual who has merely gone about protesting in a way that, yes, may have caused disruption and, yes, may have been subject to provisions of this bill, truly is the level and intent, the, the level of imposition that we should see in a free society.